Welcome back to Everything Self-Defense, where we talk about everything tactical, everything practical, and of course, everything self-defense. I'm your host, Nick Faruqi from Ballistic Fighting Methods and StreetSafe101.com, and for today's topic, we're discussing women in self-defense. In this episode, we'll be talking about some important information that women really need to realize about self-defense. I'm hoping to encourage our female audience to get more proactive in the training that they do and more proactive than they typically are. Now, this is a topic that's pretty near and dear to me. In the early 2000s, I spent almost three years volunteering at a few local domestic violence shelters. And in that time, I learned a lot. I was exposed to certain things that I never care to share. And aside from that, I've even lost a couple dear friends in my life to domestic violence turned homicide. It was these events that inspired my women's self-defense program called Fighting Chance, which now I've had the honor of teaching 80 plus times in multiple states. It's a program that I take a lot of pride in. Now, I ask a lot of women to get involved in some kind of self-defense class or training program. And more often than not, I hear a bunch of excuses. And even though I try to help these women realize the realities of life, a lot of them just don't get it. So before we begin, I would like to share a couple stories with you. First, it'll help you see how vicious life can be. And second, you'll know why this topic is so important for all of us. And hopefully, we can come away from that it won't happen to me mindset. Here's the first story, and it's about a friend of mine. This just happened uh, a few years ago. My friend went out for drinks with some of her friends for a birthday celebration. When she came home, she came home to a pissed off boyfriend who started an argument with her, then stuck a sock in her mouth and beat her. Somewhere in that encounter, she passed away. We lost her. She was found the next day by another friend who stopped by to check on her and saw feet through the window and called an ambulance. When the police and the coroner got involved, they couldn't even tell us if the cause of death was by blunt trauma to the head or the asphyxiation from the sock. This was the event that inspired the Fighting Chance program. The second story I would like to tell you is about another dear friend who I'm very proud to say is one of the strongest women I know. See, my friend got married to a man who charmed the heck out of her. They got married, they moved in, they moved out of state, they had a baby. The guy quit his job and basically began to live off of her. When the stress and frustration of being unemployed start getting to him, he eventually ended up beating on her to make himself feel better. It was almost like a schedule. Now when she had enough and decided to make a run for it, he jumps on top of the car starts punching out the window with a three-year-old kid in the back of the car. Now, luckily, she got away, and with the love and support of her friends and family, she was able to start rebuilding her life. Aside from the constant court hassles, financial drain, harassment, and constant looking over her shoulder, she was able to fight for herself, and now she has herself back. Here's another story for you, which happened just about a year ago and not too far from where I'm at. A 26-year-old woman is in her home making dinner. Her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend asks to come over just to hang out, so she gladly accepts and invites him in. After some time, they have a small argument. He decides to grab a hammer and beat her with it. And I'm not talking about the handle part. When her dog begins to bark in the confusion and noise, this guy uses a hammer to kill the dog, then returns to beating her. Now, thank God, a year later, she's still alive, but most of her life is spent in and out of the hospital, surgeries, therapy, and such. That's not really a way of living life. How about this? A 16-year-old girl travels just outside of Vegas to visit her dad. While he's at work, she goes to the local mall to kill off some time. 
a man walks up to her on her way out and says, Hey, I'm lost. Can you help me out? I'm new around here, and opens a road map. She looks down at the map. A van pulls up behind her. Two guys yank her in, and for the next 48 hours, they're beating her, raping her, beating her more, raping her more. And when they finish, they launch her out of a moving van at nearly 45 miles per hour. The next day, somebody's driving by and sees the body in the ditch and calls the police. Now, since then, she's been through over 100 reconstructive surgeries, thousands of hours of counseling. This kid's never going to be the same. Her youth, her life, her state of me, it's been stripped of her. This was the daughter of a friend of a friend. Let me give you another story. To tell you the truth, this episode couldn't come at a better time. And here's why I say that. Just last week, I was honored to be a part of something that redefined the term meaningful. Let me give you the story first. A 33-year-old woman who just moves into her new home with her husband. Her husband goes to work and she's home alone, organizing or whatever she's doing. One of the neighbors decides to break in using a screwdriver. He's surprised to see her home, so he uses that very screwdriver as a stabbing device and kills her savagely. A few hours later, her husband comes home to find the body. Now, here's why I said that this particular story has redefined the term meaningful. I was invited to come co-teach a seminar to a group of wonderful ladies who are close friends to this gal. And while I was there, they shared some moments and some words that couldn't express their love, their remorse, their strength, or their compassion anymore. I was very lucky to be a part of that. Truth is that I can keep on going with more stories, but... Hopefully, by now, we're past the it-won't-happen-to-me crap. Violence knows no demographic, no location, no names, no ages, no limits. Bad things happen to good people everywhere and at any time. Let me give you some statistics to reinforce my point. 70% of women assaulted will be done so by someone they know. One in three women will be a victim to domestic violence. Every nine seconds, a woman in the U.S. is assaulted or beaten. 80% of stalking victims are women. And 75% of Americans know someone who is a victim to sexual assault or domestic violence. Ladies and gentlemen, this problem is real. So knowing all of this, the question is, why don't women get more involved? Well, here's the most common reasons, if you can call it that, that I hear. My husband or boyfriend will protect me. Nothing happens where I live. Nothing has happened to me so far. I just don't have time for that. I'm a female and I can't fight off a guy. Or, this is my favorite, I don't believe in violence. Ladies, not being a victim first requires you to recognize the threat. You have the time to go to yoga class, or to Zumba, or Piloxing, or whatever. Do you not value yourself enough to learn what it takes to protect your life, or the life of your offspring? Truth is that we live in a society where women are taught to be strong, educated citizens. But when it comes to talking about anything combative like self-defense, it becomes very much a man's world. But the truth behind that is that if anyone at all needs to get involved, it's women. You see, most altercations for men are ego-driven and become a win-or-lose type of thing. If I got into a fight today, most likely both of us are going home at the end of it. But for women, 
it's very much a survive type situation. Because if a woman gets attacked today, she's facing assault, rape, abduction, homicide. So the consequences are much greater for females than for males, typically. And another issue for women is simply that they don't want to go into a gym filled with a bunch of knuckle-dragging, mouth-breathing alpha males. They simply just don't feel comfortable with it. They definitely don't want to exchange punches or kicks with a six foot five, two hundred and fifty pound Samoan with a bad attitude. And as instructors or studio owners, we need to cater to that. We can't just say, well, it's going to be a man that attacks you. Better get used to it. All that's going to do is turn the female audience away and then they'll never train. We need to cater to their concerns a little bit. Get them in. Get them comfortable. Teach them whatever we feel is appropriate and encourage them to continue their education. Then we can insert some male energies in a controlled fashion as these ladies' skills grow. Now ladies, here's something I really want to talk about. Emotions. Kind of funny, right? Finally, a guy who wants to talk about emotions. All humor aside, let me just tell you that it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be afraid in training. It's okay to be afraid in real life situations. When it comes to being afraid in training, you'll be in some situations that will make you extremely uncomfortable. But remember this. That's a part of your training element. This is where you really get to see what you're made of and be able to train your body and your mind to function as it needs to. And it's just training. You can stop and take a moment to catch your bearings. Don't let that turn you away. As far as being afraid in those real life situations, that's natural. Anyone who tells you that they're not afraid is either a sociopath or just simply lying to you. I ran security for eight years in some pretty rough areas. I've seen over 200 altercations with multiple attackers, bottles flying, knives, guns, whatever. And I was afraid every single time. The key is to train your body to respond. Training your mind to to turn off that inner dialogue that shuts you out and turning that fear into controlled rage. If you ever heard the term harness your emotions, this is exactly what they're talking about. Accepting your fear, staying calm, and taking action regardless. The other thing that comes to my mind is this. Whether you're a tomboy kind of a female or some dainty princess, at some point, you'll find the instinct to survive and fight back. The secret is to be able to find that instinct at will and getting results for your efforts. And that's where the training comes in. We all have a God-given right to protect our lives and the lives of our offspring. But we don't always have the God-given ability to do that. That's where the training comes in. So what should women consider when looking into a self-defense class or seminar? First, you have to break out of that victim mindset. Be proud and confident of who you are. Realize that there is a problem and decide that you will fight back. But saying it is not enough. It takes training. It takes commitment. And constant refinement. To be willing is not enough, but it is a start. So here's what you should do. First, all training is good training. At the very least, it will help you raise your awareness. Second, look for a program that you feel comfortable with. Because if you're not happy, you're not going to continue. I would tell you to go visit different schools, different instructors, express to them your concerns and your lifestyle, what you're looking for. If there's other ladies in the gym, talk to them and see what they're getting out of it. And then make some good decisions. Find a place that's right for you. But before you go in, 
you should have some knowledge on what to look for. So here's the typical information that's available. Traditional martial arts is most common, in my opinion. This is your karate, taekwondo, aikido, hapkido. There's a whole lot of forms, board breaking, belts, gis, fancy techniques. Not really my preferred type of a situation. The second type of information is typically sport-minded. Boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai. And I like this because it conditions you. And you will learn how to hit and hit hard. But then you have reality-based programs, which are very easy to spot because they were constantly bringing in variables. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then there's a science behind female-specific self-defense training that I think a lot of programs are missing. So what you get is a false sense of security based on the emotional empowerment of learning some new information or hitting some guy in a big red suit. So let me share a couple of these aspects of women's programs with you. Understanding the human body. We talk about this term motor movement. The human body has three types of motor movement fine, complex, and gross. Let me give you examples. Fine motor movement would be if I told you to thread a needle. Small muscle groups doing a small task. Complex motor movement will be if I said run, jump over a hurdle, and throw a football at the same time. Multiple muscle groups doing multiple tasks. And then you have gross motor movement. If I said kick in the door, all major muscle groups, one task. See a lot of those traditional martial arts that we talked about, that typical information that's out there, they're based on fine and complex motor movement. And that's why I said that's my least preferred method. The sport-minded stuff is awesome. It does have a lot of gross motor movement. Again, you get conditioned, you hit hard. But there's variables that are not being introduced, right? First and foremost, you're typically against somebody of equal size and equal weight. And ladies, let's face it, you're never going to box with somebody because the type of engagements women have are not the same as guys. We don't have a verbal jaw jack, push, shove, I'll meet you in the parking lot, let's box kind of thing going on. You guys get ambushed. You're coming out of the store, you're walking out to your car, some jag bag jumps out from behind a tree, grabs you by your purse, by your hair, throws you to the floor, whatever. You're not going to be able to box or kickbox with that kind of an attack. Functional programs will be based on those gross motor skills. Not fine, not complex. They'll also understand the term range. And for women, we need to focus on a specific range that we call close quarters. This is inside of punching and kicking range. It's a very intimate distance, and it's extremely uncomfortable for people who don't understand it. Close quarter is the specific range for women because, again, the nature of your attack. Somebody's latched onto you. They've thrown you to the floor. They're pulling and pushing from your arm, from your hair, from your neck. It's very tactile. But... Close quarter has a lot of advantages that you need to understand as well. Speed and footwork don't make a difference. Big punching power doesn't take play. You're too close. Nobody can really steam up that punch. And the closer you are, the more striking tools you will have available. In long range, let's just say like kicking range, you have two hands, two feet that you can make contact with. In mid range, you have two hands, two feet two elbows, and two knees. In close range, you literally have any part of your body, the shoulder, the bicep, head butting, eye gouging, biting, all that's available from close quarter. So we like the close quarter training for ladies. Second thing that you should understand is targeting and tactics. And I say this at every seminar. The human body is not designed to fight. If you look at the best hunters, the best warriors that nature has to offer, you'll see lions, tigers, 
bears, sharks, orangutans, cheetahs, whatever. The human body doesn't have those type of characteristics. We walk upright, exposing our genital region. We walk only on two feet and not four. Our eyes are very sensitive and exposed. Our heads sit on top of our neck instead of in front of it. We don't have strong jaws. We don't have big teeth. We don't have vicious claws. We don't have any real body armor or cladding. We have a lot of joints that are easy to manipulate. We have thousands of nerve endings, so we feel pain very easily. We don't have that natural instinct to kill. But the one thing that we do have is sheer brain power. We can understand tactics and behavior and expose the weaknesses of another human being. So why am I telling you this? Because if you're one of those women out there saying that you cannot take down a male, I say that you're not using that brain power. You can take someone down despite size, gender, strength by attacking particular targets, by employing particular tactics. That's where that brain power comes in. This is what training is. The eyes, the throat, the groin, and the shin, and the knees. These are what I call soft targets, meaning you can't condition them to receive pain. How much do you have to be able to bench press before your eyes can take pain? Now, I wear contact lenses. If I get a piece of dust behind my contact, I'm down and out for the count for like two weeks. Imagine attacking somebody in the eye via eye gouge or eye jab or the throat or the groin. So these are soft targets. Now, functional programs will also introduce you to variables. Remember I said that a few minutes ago? These are the variables. Weaponry, multiple attackers, ground fighting, stand-up fighting, threat recognition, evasion tactics, distraction tactics. These are the things that a functional program will teach you. So when you're looking at different programs, keep a few of these things in mind. And I can give you tons more information if you need it. I'm just confined to a 30-minute slot here. But feel free to contact me from my website at www.streetsafe101.com. My email and phone number are both on there. I encourage all of our female audience to please get involved in some kind of self-defense course. Value your life. Respect yourself enough to do whatever you can to be able to protect yourself. If you prepare and nothing ever happens, you've lost nothing. But if you don't prepare and something does happen, you stand to lose everything. Let me also say this. The true secret to safety is awareness. Self-defense programs will definitely teach you what to do in the situation. But awareness training will teach you how to avoid it completely. How to be aware of yourself. How to be aware of your environment. How to be aware of people around you. How to recognize suspicious behavior. Now this is an entirely other topic and Hopefully in the future we'll get a chance to talk on this because I have a lot to say. Ladies, best of luck, but I ask you to get involved. And now it's time for In This Corner. This is where I get a chance to read off a couple emails that I received from previous shows uh, and answer some questions. So here's the first email. This is from Zachary in Canada, somewhere out there. Nick, lots of good information on the weapon show. How do you feel about tasers? <laughs> Zachary, thanks for the email, and I hope you're listening. I like tasers. I think they're fun, but they're just that. If there is a weapon that malfunctions the most, it's tasers. If there is a weapon that's clunky and hard to carry around, it's tasers. Here in Illinois, we are still required to have a FOID card to have a taser, and you cannot conceal carry it as a citizen. So having it is, doesn't really do you much good. And you have to be aware of some of the variables because I've seen tasers used on somebody who's wearing like a thick down winter jacket and it doesn't really get to them. So even apparel can 
pretty much put that weapon out of play. Aside from that, tasers are only good for a few moments, right? When you're holding the trigger and zapping somebody, you have them under control. But when you release the trigger and you're no longer zapping someone, they're back to full strength. And there's a lot of videos on YouTube from police officers using tasers. And when they let off the trigger, the guy gets up and pounds on them. It's actually kind of comical to watch how quickly these people jump back to their feet. So as much fun as I think tasers are, not necessarily the best weapon in self-defense. Thanks for the email, Zach. The next email is from Scott. Scott says, Nick, what kind of knives do you recommend? Uh, the answer is this. Scott, every state and every jurisdiction has its own requirements uh, on what you can and cannot carry. As far as brands, I'm a big Cold Steel fan because I think they're giving out a lot of product, quality materials, quality build. They're durable, they're sharp, some great designs for a affordable price. I've also liked the Spyderco and the Benchmade, but they're very expensive. And I'd hate to lose it, let alone use it. So I'd rather have a blade that I'm ready to put to work. And that's what Cold Steel really offers. I also like folders so I can keep them in my pocket. Uh, Here in Illinois, we have requirements as far as blade lengths and how you can carry them. So you have to find out what the jurisdiction that you're in allows you to carry and then make a decision off of that. Thanks for the email, Scott. And there you have it, folks. We've gotten a chance to talk a little bit more about women in self-defense and some aspects to consider, along with answering some questions for you. On the next episode, we'll be talking about how not to get into a fight. So we'll be talking about some verbal de-escalation tactics and such. Stay tuned for that. I'd like to thank David Lombardo from On Target Radio in Safer USA. Check out his podcast out at On Target Radio or listen live on Chicago's AM560 WIND on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. I'd also like to thank the Illinois State Rifle Association for their support in all of my training ventures, but especially for their fine work downstate in Illinois for protecting our gun rights. Make sure that you guys join them and show your support now. I'd also like to say this. This episode is dedicated to Lisa Ellis. Lisa, I never got a chance to meet you. But I met some of your friends last week who love you very, very much. And I can tell you that you'll never be forgotten. May you rest in peace. And that's it for today, folks. I'm your host, Nick Faruqi from Ballistic Fighting Methods and StreetSafe101.com. Make sure you follow us on Facebook at StreetSafe101. I'm out of here. (laughs) 